Well, hi everyone. Fergus McGinley here. Welcome to the Seminary of the Third Age May series, The Authentic Jesus for Now, with tonight's topic, How the Kingdom of God Relates to the Kingdoms of This World. And the title of my talk tonight is, We Want Democracy. I'm going to scroll you through a series of PowerPoint slides, but don't worry too much if you can't get to the slides. I'll talk you through what's on each of them. So, here we go. We want democracy. It's a sort of theology of democracy. Now, who are these people on the first slide? They're, pro they're people protesting on the streets of Myanmar in recent times, and also their shoes and thongs. What do they want? Well, you can see, we want democracy. They want their elected leader, Aung San Suu Kyi, back. But more than that, they want freedom, agency, control over their own lives, a democratic way of life. They're sick of having their lives controlled by a bunch of crazy generals. Now in the next slide, these people, protesters on the streets of Hong Kong in 2019, probably a lot of them are in jail now or have fled the country, they also want freedom and democracy. They don't want to live under the tyranny of the Chinese Communist Party with their lives controlled in the same way as their compatriots on the mainland. They thought they had democracy, but now it seems to be slipping through their fingers. And on the next slide, Black Lives Matter. These people, protesters on US streets in 2020, after the killing of George Floyd in broad daylight by a policeman in Minneapolis, want democracy too. They want real democracy, not just a limited sham democracy in which black people continue to be treated unequally and are the subject of racist violence, discrimination and injustice. Notice uh, especially that the American flag is not being burnt. Rather, the protests are actually appealing to it, that great symbol of the American democratic way of life. And then the next slide, these people also want democracy. Indigenous Australians with the Uluru Statement from the Heart. They want a real and equal place in the beautiful Australian Commonwealth. They want an acknowledgement of their original ownership of this land in the Constitution and an effective and lasting voice to Parliament. A say over their own lives, in other words. All of which is, in a word, democracy. But more on the Uluru Statement later in the presentation. So, what do they and we all want? Democracy. When do they and we want it? Now. And in the next slide, yes, so many people around the world are crying out for one thing, democracy, whether it's people still living under tyrannical, anti-democratic regime, regimes around the world, or people in democratic countries like the US and Australia, suffering continued discrimination, inequality, racism, injustice. They're calling out not just for democratic rule and governance, but for a more democratic way of life. The four societies we looked at in the slides in Myanmar, Hong Kong, the US and Australia are all at different stages of democratic development. But in each case, what is really going on behind all the political, military, legal machinations, the grassroots activism and people on the streets, is, I think, a gradual spiritual transformation. People are gradually changing deep inside, their attitude, their thinking, their beliefs, their hopes and dreams about life. This spiritual transformation is, it seems to me, akin to the gospel. In fact, it's so akin to the gospel that it is actually, I think, the gospel. This, in fact, is my core hypothesis in tonight's talk, to see democratic development in the world as foremostly a spiritual transformation and to therefore draw a direct link between democracy and the gospel. It's what you might call a theology of democracy. So, on this next slide, here's the core hypothesis in three parts. Firstly, 
democracy is love. Well, what a radical, outrageous idea. As a quality of how people interact with each other day to day, as a way of life, democracy is love. Selfless, open, inclusive love, Christ's love, God's love, that is, the gospel. So that's the, that's the link between democracy and the gospel, through love. Secondly, democracy is the spiritual transformation of society. The transition to and development of democratic society is primarily a spiritual transformation. And the third part of the hypothesis, the kingdom of God, which is the world brought to fruition through Christ and the Holy Spirit, is the bringing to fruition of democracy in the world. So there you have it, my core hypothesis. Now before I attempt to convince you all this of all this, let me give you some key references. So you can see on the next slide three old references and two very new ones. The old ones are first, firstly Henri Bergson, the great French philosopher of, the, philosopher of the late 19th and early 20th century with his late work, The Two Sources of Morality and Religion in 1932. Then Albert Camus, the wonderful French existentialist writer with The Rebel, in 1951. And thirdly, John Dewey, the renowned American pragmatist philosopher, political and educational theorist with Freedom and Culture, 1929. The very new ones, I've heard both these writers interviewed on radio about their books in the last year or so, are firstly, the American academic theologian Luke Bretherton, with Christ and the Common Life, The Case for Democracy in 2019, and the British writer Tom Holland with Dominion, also 2019. So some great readings, some great references there. Now, before we go a step further, a cautionary tale. This is on the next slide. Democracy, the democracy is love that I'm going to try to convince you of tonight, actually has plenty of blood on its hands. The development of democracy in the West in what used to be called Christendom, then its gradual spread to the rest of the world, has been a long time coming, full of distortions, reversions, real failures. One step forward and often several steps back. In particular, the whole sorry history of European Western colonial capitalist imperial expansion and exploitation over the last X hundred years has actually given democracy, and the gospel for that matter, a bad name. Lots of blood on its hands. So there's no time, there's never time for democratic triumphalism. After the fall of the Berlin Wall in the late 1980s, then the so-called Arab Spring in the, in the 80s and 90s, we were all feeling pretty good about democracy, I think. Remember Francis Fukuyama's end of history and the neocons of the early 2000s. But all that seems now to have just crumpled in a heap with the debacles in Iraq and Afghanistan, Syria, the Egyptian counter-revolution, the rise of China, and so on. And we now seem to be back almost to square one. So yes, no time for democratic triumphalism. And in the next slide, but in spite of this, or perhaps because of, these very real historic failures of democracy, which really are very much also, I think, failures of Christianity, my call tonight, which I'm going to try to convince you of, is for Christians to renew their personal allegiance and commitment to democracy and a democratic way of life. So the next slide, democracy, a democratic way of life, my hypothesis that democracy is love. Well, what exactly is democracy and where does it begin? Democracy begins not with govern governance, with the democratic state, but with you and me. You see, governance, statecraft, ruling is the visible macro level of democracy. We're talking about things like elections, parliament, state institutions, bureaucracy, the military, the legal system, international relations and trade, 
and so on. But underneath this macro level, democracy has a micro level. And it, and it is at this micro level that democracy really begins. And in the next slide, the micro level of democracy is individual people, you and me, living our lives day to day, interacting with each other in families, workplaces, communities, societies, physical environments. It is a quality of how we live and interact with each other. And in the next slide, here's a lovely, very recent off-the-cuff quote from the, the Radio National show, The Minefield, by host Scott Stevens, channeling John Dewey, whom I've already mentioned, which expresses just this view of the micro level of democracy. As John Dewey put it, quotes, the social cues and daily practices that turn democracy into a moral reality. End of quote. The idea that democracy doesn't exist as much in institutions as it does in certain forms of essentially egalitarian, open-handed interactions with others. Democracy is something that we learn how to do every day in the way that we refuse certain forms of entitlement certain positions of status or of contempt towards others. From this point of view, the problems that we observe, that we're constantly tearing our hair out about in how democratic governments and institutions operate, really begin at the micro level with how each of us interacts with our friends, neighbours, strangers, day to day in our families, communities and societies. If there's something wrong at the macro level, then this really begins at the micro level. So as a quality of how we live, behave, interact with each other day to day, what exactly is democracy? An intentional democratic way of living, in other words. In, in the next slide, well, living democratically means, I think, that we listen talk to each other, negotiate and work things out together. We eschew all forms of manipulation, coercion, violence, dominance, exclusion, privilege. And we relate in this way to all people, family, friends, strangers, even people we dislike or fear. We lay aside our self-interest in favour of the common interest of all, the richest, most powerful person and the poorest, least powerful person agree to have exactly the same voting power, one. In other words, we practice selfless, open, inclusive love. What else could you call it? That is Christ's love, God's love. So really, a democratic way of life is essentially, it seems to me, a gospel way of life. And in the next slide, think about it. The gospel is essentially relational, about relationships with God, with other people, with the world. Sin is always sinful relationships. Each one of the Ten Commandments, for example, is about relationships. When we allow the gospel to transform us internally, we then move outwards into the world with an attitude of love, looking to build positive, loving relationships with others, with all people, friend, stranger, enemy, the friendless, the poor, etc. Striving for what Luke Bretherton calls a flourishing common life together. This is the gospel model of neighbour love, of love thy neighbour. So the next slide. Democracy, therefore, is... Love thy neighbour. For example, when a democratic government operating with the will of the people takes money through taxation from those who have a surplus and gives it to those who don't have enough in order to build up their economic agency, for example, most recently, the Job Seeker and Job Keeper programs in Australia, this is love thy neighbour. It transforms both giver and receiver and thus transforms society. So you can see clearly here how a spiritual transformation 
leads to an economic transformation. In the next slide, democracy is love thy neighbour and this sort of open love has an essential element of kenosis. I'm referring to the famous Philippians passage about what Jesus let go of when he went to the cross. Chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. Quotes, Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges, he took the humble position of a slave, and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. So the next slide. Kenosis, that lovely Greek word, is or means self-emptying, letting go of power, of self. It's the first movement of love. Democracy is essentially kenotic in two senses. Firstly, the individual decision to participate in a democratic community or society is a letting go of individual power and self-interest in favour of a shared common life with others. Secondly, the democratic state itself is self-limiting. It is subject to the vote or approval of the people and to a dispersal and devolution of power through multiple levels of government and through independent democratic institutions. Let's go to the next slide. Let's look a little now at the history of democratic development. The early Christian communities were in fact a great model of democracy. The believers sharing their lives together with love, care, inclusivity, acceptance of differences. Acts 2, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, quotes, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So you can see in these early communities, the saving or converting of people individually was simultaneously the saving or converting of their communities. And on to the next slide. But you're probably going to say to me that no, no, democracy doesn't start historically with the gospel and the early Christian communities. Rather, the earliest recorded forms of democracy are associated with pre-Christian classical Greece. But what about classical Greece? Well, Athenian democracy was firstly limited and exclusive. Only citizens were allowed to participate. The majority of people, women, slaves, foreigners, were excluded. It was really a sharing of power, not love, for the exclusive benefit of citizens in maintaining their privilege and dominance over non-citizens. So it was a nice start, certainly better than the tyranny of absolute rulers that came before, but it lacked something really important. Yes, love. We don't get the real beginning of democracy, in fact, until the cross and the resurrection. To the next slide. The critical moment, I think, is the conversion of the Apostle Paul on the Damascus Road. With Paul, we get the intersection and welding together of the Greek idea of democracy with the gospel. This is the lovely story told in Dominion by Tom Holland in Chapter 3, Mission. The next slide. The two key elements of the gospel democracy intersection are, firstly, the inclusivity and the universality of the gospel. It is for all people, Jew, Gentile, etc., which leads to an inclusive, universal conception of democracy. Secondly, all temporal rulers and rule 
is to be constrained by law which exists independently of that rule. A spiritual law or covenant which is effectively a law of the people because it makes that rule accountable to the people by being accountable to God. And to the next slide. And so democracy evolves from here, from the time of Paul and the early Christian communities, firstly in the Christian West, what we call Christendom, then gradually outwards to the rest of the world. It's a long time coming, of course, and we've got a long way to go, obviously. Tom Holland tells the interesting story so far in his book. There are plenty of failures and reversions along the way. I've already told you a first cautionary tale, the whole sorry history of colonialism and capitalist expansion. And the problems just keep on coming. Think of in more recent times, for example, democracy seemingly going backwards in places like Myanmar, Hong Kong, which we've already mentioned, Russia, Turkey, Syria, Egypt and so on. Recent murders of women and children in domestic violence situations in Australia. Recent revelations of sexual harassment, bullying and abuse in the Australian Parliament. The rise of Trumpism and populism in the US and elsewhere. Continued racial injustice in Australia, the US and so on. So the problems keep on coming. But we're talking here about failures of, challenges for democracy, not reasons for abandoning it. Quite the contrary. They're all the more reason for us, as I've said, to keep renewing our personal commitment to democracy and a democratic way of life. Democracy as a gospel kingdom way of life. To the next slide. Now, you were probably wondering when I was going to say something about the great reformer Martin Luther. How the kingdom of God relates to the kingdoms of this world is just the sort of question Luther would have asked. Luther was famous, among other things, for his two kingdoms doctrine. The two kingdoms in question were the church and the state. Luther was keen for both the state to keep its hands off the church and for the church to keep its hands off the state. So we have from this the famous separation of church and state, which funnily enough, Anthony Albanese recently invoked when he wanted to criticise Scott Morrison when Scott recently claimed at a church conference that God had called him to serve the country as PM. And, and according to Luther, God is above both kingdoms church and state, and we, of course, live in both kingdoms. So the question Luther really wanted to answer is, how do we live as citizens of the secular state? My, my answer, of course, tonight is democratically. To the next slide. In relation to politics, to that second kingdom, contemporary Christians are more or less divided along party lines. Evangelicals and, and Pentecostals, firstly, tend to see politics as secondary or incidental. They adopt a humanitarian approach to the poor and powerless, at the same time as being indifferent to politics, political quietism, you might say, or focusing solely on moral issues. For example, the highly conservative moral majority, or even positively siding with libertarian capitalism, the so-called prosperity gospel. On the other hand, liberal progressives generally take an activist approach to politics but tend to side with a soft Marxist socialist approach and we'll get to Marxism shortly. Their political activism is usually not explicitly expressed in terms of their Christian faith and any identification of their political views with the church or Christianity is usually avoided. They are often the first to criticise a conservative politician for any sense in which they are bringing their faith into their politics. And the example there was the recent criticism of Scott Morrison. So Christians are pretty divided, confused you might say, about what approach to take to secular politics. But how do things look from the position we're taking tonight? 
which makes a direct link between the gospel and democratic politics. And in the next slide, specifically from this point of view, the role of the church is firstly to be a model, a witness of democratic common life through how we do worship, sacraments, prayer and so on, and through church life in general. Secondly, to be a witness of the great hope of the gospel and the kingdom, which, as I've argued, is the real spiritual trans foundation of democracy. This kingdom vision is the idea ideology of democracy which inspires and drives democratic development. Without such a vision, what hope or reason can anyone have for believing in and aspiring for democracy? As citizens of both the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world, individual Christians and church groups can live out their faith by practicing democratic politics. Christians can actually lead the way in democratic development. The rest of the population is either just going along with the flow, not really conscious or intentional about democratic politics, or distracted and misled by rival false ideologies. We're just about to talk about them. Christians, however, can really understand and therefore intentionally practice neighbour love, which is the root of democratic politics. To the next slide. So what are the alternatives, the rivals to democracy? Well, here's a nice list. Firstly, and most importantly, I think, Marxism in all its various different forms and interpretations. Secondly, good old capitalism, or as we might refer to it these days, global economic imperialism. Thirdly, there's a whole cluster of similar, similar ideologies which we might put under the heading of fascism. Imperialism, nationalism, tribalism, even Islamism, which is a sort of theocratic fascism. What all these rivals have in common, I think, is a materialist worldview, which contains within it what you might call a false spiritualism. That is, a false view of the nature of humanness and of God. Now, I don't think I need to convince you about the materialist, materialist nature of capitalism or fascism, or the fact that they are antithetical to democracy. Unconstrained by democratic politics, capitalism and fascism only lead to the material enrichment of the few and the impoverishment and disempowerment of the many. Marxism, however, seems to be motivated by a genuine desire to help the poor and therefore, on the surface, does seem to be consistent with the gospel and with the democratic ideal of a flourishing life, common life for all. But it's the materialism of Marxism, its self-proclaimed and very intentional materialism, that is its, is its real problem. What exactly do I mean by materialism in this context? To the next slide. Luke Bretherton in Christ and the Common Life has a very helpful analysis of different biblical meanings of poverty, of what it means to be poor. He distinguishes four different meanings, but I'm going to distill them down to just two. Firstly, there is material poverty, destitution or affliction, lack of basic material physical needs, food, water, shelter, physical health and so on. Secondly, there is what I'm going to call spiritual poverty, that is powerlessness or humility. In fact, this is the most common reference to poverty in the Old Testament. Spiritual poverty, in turn, has two components. Firstly, a lack of, lack of material agency or freedom caused by oppressive, unjust social and political structures. This is an external cause of spiritual poverty. And secondly, a lack of spiritual agency or freedom caused by sin. This is an internal cause of spiritual poverty. 
to the next slide. Now, a materialist approach generally, I would contend, focuses on material poverty, on destitution and affliction, but spiritual poverty, poverty, that is powerlessness and lack of material and spiritual agency, is either ignored or seen as less significant or secondary. But, and here's the big but, spiritual poverty is the cause of material poverty. So unless you deal with spiritual poverty first, you'll only end up reinforcing material poverty. To the next slide. Now, materialism, uh, now Marxism, I should say, however, certainly does acknowledge spiritual poverty, that is, powerlessness, lack of agency. In fact, it focuses on it. But it reduces spiritual agency to just material agency, that is, to control over the material economic means of production. So, Marxism sacrifices real spiritual agency in order to gain material equality. And so we get the totalitarian socialist state where people are theoretically more materially equal but live in a total spiritual poverty with no political agency and a complete lack of inner spiritual agency. The dictatorship of the proletariat the withering away of the state. Marxism actually has its own version of the kingdom, which unfortunately will, will never, can never come. Marxism, and for that matter later liberation theology, which is a sort of theology of Marxism, are really responses to the historic failures of democracy I described earlier democracy not yet fully transformed by the gospel, still deeply infected with sin. To the next slide. However, democracy as love, spiritually transformed by the gospel, unlike Marxism, addresses both the internal and external causes of spiritual poverty. Real human agency, freedom, liberation, is spiritual first, material second. So that the change, the movement towards true freedom and liberation must start within a person. You must, quotes, be the change you want to see in the world. As Obama channeling Gandhi said, democracy, you might say, is always the middle path between the ideological extremes between the political right and the political left, between fascism on one hand and Marxism on the other, between capitalism and socialism, and between conservative and progressive. Now, finally, to the Uluru Statement and the call for an indigenous voice to parliament, which we mentioned at the start of this presentation. What has this got to do with democracy? To the next slide. Here's a great quote from Carla Grant, host of Living Black on ABC TV, interviewed recently on RN Blueprint for Living. Quotes, we know the solutions to the issues that we face as well, and governments need to actually sit down with us and listen, and not just do things to us. I think Malcolm Turnbull said that. We don't want to do things to you, we want to do things with you. But that's been the case for years, hundreds of years of white occupation in this country, that we keep on having things done to us, not with us. And so we want to be able to have a seat at that table and to be able to talk about the issues that face us and have an input into the policies and programs that are going to improve the lives of Indigenous Australians. So it's very important that we speak we have to speak to each other because we're both in this land together. To the next slide. In democratic terms, Aboriginal people in Australia suffer from the tyranny of majoritarianism. They now occupy such a small percentage of the Australian population, 3.3% in 2016, that it is not possible for their unique place as First Peoples of Australia 
to be represented effectively in Parliament. This was clearly pointed out by Noel Pearson in his 2014 quarterly essay, A Rightful Place. It means that Aboriginal people are unable to participate fully in Australian democratic life, a situation which is unjust and untenable for them and which diminishes all of us, all Australians. Pearson called for constitutional change to recognise Aboriginal people as First Peoples and to establish an Indigenous voice to Parliament. This would help to make Australia what Pearson calls a more complete Commonwealth. It would be an act of real democracy, that is, of real love, transforming both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians. The history, the failure of democracy, is compelling. The circumstances of the formation of the British colonies, which later became the modern nation of Australia, namely the violent dispossession of the original inhabitants, was such as to exclude right from the start those original inhabitants from full participation in Australian democratic polity. It was terra nullius. They didn't even exist. The 1967 referendum granting full voting rights to Aboriginal people only partially remedied this exclusion in that it didn't acknowledge the original sovereignty of Aboriginal people in any way so that the only choice Aboriginal people have ever really had is just to merge into the general Australian population and for their Aboriginality to consequently dwindle and disappear. They've never been given a real choice, in other words. Their voice in the formation and development of Australian democratic common life has never been fully heard. So... Only constitutional recognition of original sovereignty and constitutional enshrinement of a voice to Parliament, as called for by the Uluru Statement, can give Aboriginal people the opportunity to participate fully, equally in Australian democracy. And so to the next slide. Let me finish with two lovely quotes. Firstly, Ala Alaswani, the Egyptian novelist interviewed very recently on RN's The Book Show. Egypt after the Egyptian Revolution, you'll remember the Tahrir Square protests and the overthrow of the Mubarak di dictatorship, has now returned to a military dictatorship. But the changes affected by the revolution are, according to Alaswani, irreversible. Quotes, Yes, Absolutely, because I see the difference between the political change and the revolution. You see, the, spirit, the revolution is much more profound than a political change. Politically, Egypt now is worse than before. But the revolution is not only politics. I mean, the revolution is the profound change and the thoughts and the vision of life and everything. And I must tell you that I believe that Egyptians living in Egypt now, or even abroad, they are no more the Egyptians they used to be before the revolution. Something happened, and this is irreversible, and this is something the military dictatorship never understood, you know, because the people look the same, but the mentality is different. End of quote. So the movement towards democracy in Egypt is a real, irreversible, spiritual transformation. Great hope for the future in spite of current appearances. And to the next slide. I'll give the final word, word to Charles Strong, that great pioneer of Australian progressive Christianity, the great pioneer of pacifism and democracy. Quotes, and this is from one of his famous sermons. Jesus does not proclaim the destruction of the sense life or the annihilation of the intellect or propose to dispense with the moral life, but he proclaims a kingdom of healthy manhood and womanhood, a kingdom which, no doubt, stretches into the invisible, like some magnificent painting suggesting far more than the artist can put into a few feet or inches of canvas, but yet a kingdom which is here and now, a God's will on earth. Christianity is no mere promise of happiness after death, 
It is an invitation to more life and fuller now. And to the next slide. Yes, bravo Charles. And that kingdom which is here and now, if also not yet, this fuller life now, is the inclusive, flourishing, common life that we build through living out the gospel. That is, through our participation in and commitment to democracy and a democratic way of life in all its forms, in our lives and in our world. Amen. Thank you so much for listening.